previously on Seth Signs. Well, you broke into the bottom of this copyright claim system? And who is this mysterious Mr. Ryan, the video game attorney? Find out now on this very exciting episode of Seth Signs. Hey guys, full warning, today's topic is about the law, which is a very, 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 very deep topic, and it might be a little hard for me to explain. However, I'll do the best that I can to make this as easy as possible, but please forgive me if you find any contradictions, because the law itself is a contradiction. But without further ado, let's go to battle. So, Mr. Ryan, I'm really honored for you to stop by during this random lunch break because who better to answer questions about fair use than the video game attorney? <laughs> but first things first, what is this crazy thing called fair use? Sure, so it's important to understand that fair use is different in every country and uh, even different in jurisdictions here federally. There are different circuits that have different opinions. Uh, primarily though, it's a four-factor test where it matters if you're making money, but that's not all that matters. So there's plenty of free things that are still infringing and not fair use. It matters how much of the original you used, but there's no fine line. So anyone saying something that, oh, if you use under 30 seconds, you're okay, that's all complete nonsense. That's not ever been said. So it does matter how much you use, but there is no black and white line. Which means no matter what you've heard, in terms of the law, fair use has many different definitions while having no definition at all. It's confusing stuff, I know, but here's an example. If I play 10 seconds of a 90 minute film with my own added edits and call it transformative, which then should make it within fair use, the copyright owner could watch it and say that it isn't fair use because my video uses the most important part, ruins big plot points, it will hurt sales and XYZ, but guess what? We're both in the right. It is fair use and isn't fair use at the same time, all depending on who you ask. And do you know who you have to ask to solve your fair use fight? Yep, a judge in the court of law. One would say to go off case law, or the result of past cases to define fair use, but even that gets tricky. Someone could have won a case in the past using fair use as a defense, like in Lens vs Universal in 2008, where Lens won vs Universal after Universal removed her video of Lens's one-year-old son dancing with one of Universal's artist's songs playing in the background. Which you think would go to show how to use fair use for all cases after it, right? Well wrong. In another case, House of Bryant LLC versus a and &E one year later, a and &E was doing a documentary on the University of Tennessee and they used an 11 to 13 second clip from the University of Tennessee and get this, they used a clip with a band performing a song and the song the band was playing was actually licensed to play, but the song was only licensed to be performed and not filmed and so a and &E lost the case. So you see, there's no telling what type of curveball you'll be thrown with fair use. Even if you get 100 fair use case laws on your side, fair use is a judge created formula dating back to the 19th century and stated in the 1976 Copyright Act. Both the fact patterns and the legal application have evolved over time and you should seek legal assistance as necessary and appropriate. Or in other words, you'll never really know until the judge brings down that gavel. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're trying to tell me that my work might not be transformative, even though I have a whole community agreeing with me? I don't think that you know what you're talking about. Mr. Ryan, is this true? Is fair use more of a legal defense? It is, and that's why it's so hard for someone like YouTube to go around and say, hey, this is fair use and this isn't, because nothing is fair use until a judge says it is. And fair use is not a right, it's a defense. So until you go through the whole court process and a judge says, yes, this is fair use, you're not gonna get anyone else saying it. Uh, and if YouTube does say it, they're potentially liable and that's not the game they wanna play. They're not gonna risk going out of business by defending everyone's 100 person Minecraft channels. You have to understand, to say that something is transformative is very subjective, meaning it's based on a person's interpretation. Objective facts like the sun isn't brighter than my car's headlights is easy to solve because the brightness of both can be measured and compared. To say that my Dr. Seuss parody is transformative, however, cannot be measured, at least not by any way that's easy and agreeable. And with that, it gives judges a lot of room within the copyright laws for their own interpretation that may 
or may not be in your favor. But I'm curious, do you still think that deciding fair use is easy as deciding day and night? Then let's play a game of Is That Fair? Hello and welcome to Is That Fair? Where you get to compare your judgment against real fair use court cases. The rules are simple, I'll show you two case works, original will be on the left, fair use case work will be on the right, and you'll have five seconds to decide who you rule in favor of, and then I'll give you the results. All real court cases, all real judge rulings, all real fun. Now let's ask, is that fair? Okay, first on the list is the famous Hope poster. On the left is the original work, a photograph, and on the right is the fair use case work, a poster, which went on to make lots and lots of money. Is the fair use case work on the right transforming enough to constitute new art? You are the judge, take five seconds to decide who you rule in favor of, then I'll give you the results. Start the clock. Is that fair? All right, judges, five seconds are up. The result is that the casework on the right is... Settled out of court. That's right, you heard it. The creators agreed that the poster is both of their works and to split the profits. Is that fair? Okay, next up is Rogers vs. Coons. On the left, we have the original work, a photograph, and on the right, we have the fair use casework. No, not the image itself, but the statue within the image, which the statue sold for lots and lots of money. Is the fair use case work on the right transformed enough to constitute new art? You are the judge, take five seconds to decide who you rule really in favor of, then I'll give you the results. Start the clock. Is that fair? Is that fair? All right, judges, five seconds are up. The result is that the case work on the right is not transformative. That's right, fair use case work on the right was forced to pay the original creator for the profits that he made off the statues. Is that fair? All right, judges, how are we feeling out there, huh? Okay, our final case work for the day is Cardio versus Prince. On the right, we have the original work, a photograph, and on the left, we have the fair use case work, also a photograph, which went on to feature in galleries and allegedly made millions. Is the fair use case work on the right transformative enough to constitute new art? You are the judge, take five seconds to decide who you will in favor of, then I'll give you the results. Start the clock. Is that fair? Is that fair? All right, judges, five seconds are up, and the result is that case work on the right is transformative. No joke, casework on the right was decided to be fair use in court, and casework on the right could continue to go on to make its alleged millions. Is that fair? Well, all right, that does it for today's show, but I want to thank all you judges out there for participating. I'll see you again next time on Is That Fair? So, judges, how did you do? <laughs> what I want you to take away from that is this. The copyright law isn't as clear and easy as, say, for example, anything under one ounce of marijuana is personal use and anything over is intent to sell. It's a lot deeper than that. And again, it requires a person's interpretation. And regardless if you like it or not, this is the law that determines fair use. All right, well, I can see that the copyright laws are getting messy fast. There's so much about the law that just gives me a headache. But that doesn't excuse YouTube and their horrible copyright claim system, right? Mr. Ryan, how come they don't at least fix their copyright claim system? You have to keep in mind, this is not just YouTube, this is copyright and the internet, which is huge. Uh, so the, the flip side of that is, yeah, it, I mean, copyright, all intellectual property has for a very long time been the land of kings. You are gonna, you need a lot of money to enforce it. You need a lot of money to keep everything registered. And it's, it's usually been big company versus big company. Now with the internet and with how easy it is for, for you to make a video or for someone else to release a game, you see all these smaller guys that might have a big following or a big fan base, but they're getting bullied around because they just don't have the, the millions to, you know, be properly protected. Now, Mr. Ryan's info is very important. The DMCA or Digital Millennium Copyright Act is much bigger than YouTube. The question isn't how come YouTube doesn't fix their copyright claim system. The real question is how much can YouTube change about their copyright claim system? If you're looking at YouTube as, oh, please fix your horrible copyright claim system, trust that I'm only trying to help you out when I say this, but stop looking at it like that. 
It only shows how much you don't know about this very serious topic, especially towards people like Susan W, the CEO of YouTube. In fact, anyone who uses YouTube, be it for money, entertainment, or simply just info, should praise the DMCA to a certain degree because without the DMCA, YouTube wouldn't exist today. What am I talking about, you ask? Well, that's went all the way back to 2007. On March 13, 2007, I was 15 years old. Uh, how is that important? <laughs> Shut up, silhouette. I am producing this episode, not you. Oh. <clears throat> Anywho, on March 13, 2007, Viacom filed a lawsuit against not only YouTube, but Google as well, seeking $1 billion in damages. And if it weren't for the DMCA, a $1 billion loss in 2007 could surely have bankrupt the company. And the YouTube that you know and love today may not have even existed. And that's why viewing it as YouTube needs to fix its copyright claim system is bad because they're pretty much using the world's copyright claim system. They're only following the rules set in place by the DMCA so they don't get another billion dollar lawsuit. If YouTube tries to bend these rules even a tiny bit, say to back I Hate Everything or Team 4 Star, leaving their infringement claim content on the site, that gives the copyright claimant the right to also sue YouTube and access YouTube's wealth because the DMCA orders YouTube to remove the claim content as fast as possible and not doing so could possibly mean that not only will I Hate Everything and Team 4 Star's channels go down, but every single channel on YouTube when YouTube loses a lawsuit of a billion dollars or something crazy like that. Now. Please hear me out. I fully believe that removing any channel without notice is a horrible thing to do and I don't agree that it's right, but seeing as YouTube isn't in control of the DMCA, it's like the self-driving car philosophical question. Does a self-driving car hit a young child or an old lady if those are the only two options it has? I think that with that information presented, it's hard to say that YouTube didn't make the right choices here. Hmm, so then, YouTube doesn't own their copyright claim system. I get that, but why is the DMCA like this? Well, in order to really answer this question, you must take a page out of economics. Yep, time to take a look at capitalism. <laughs> Please keep all hands, arms, and feet inside the riot at all times. Now, capitalism is a very deep system, and to fully understand it, it takes a lot of info. But to put it simply, the goal of capitalism is to make as much money as possible. They who dies with the nicest things, wins. In a nutshell. And as I'm sure most of us know, making a lot of money isn't the easiest thing to do, and definitely not easy if you're looking to stay ethical. And that's why those with power and money do everything they can to not only hold on to what they have, but also to grow it. Which is why I'd like to introduce you all to SOPA and PIPA, or Stop Online Privacy Act and Protect Intellectual Property Act. Mr. Ryan, take it away. SOPA and PIPA was even worse. Uh, the DMCA take down the video, then you can talk about it. You can have an appeal process after, et cetera, et cetera. SOPA and PIPA were kind of doing this with everything and anything, allowing these big companies to basically just have a hammer and swing it wherever they wanted with no repercussions. It was going to be international. Uh, there was a lot of, yeah, there was a lot of extra bad stuff with that. Uh, the DMCA deals more with user generated content on a host website. So it's, if you're making your videos and uploading them on your own website, that's not DMCA protected anymore. That's you, that's you're the creator and the host. There's no liability shield there for the host. SOPA and PIPA were going to make it that if you had your own blog and you're writing articles about something and it's just on your website, I can just destroy your website because it's criticizing me in a way I don't like. Uh, maybe not to that degree, but that's certainly a lot of people's fears, you know, that Wikipedia would be taken down because a senator didn't like his, his, uh, his entries there. Uh, so that was terrifying. And we've had similar laws enacted that got through. Uh, and we'll see how everything kind of shakes out. Or to summarize Mr. Ryan's info, keep those with power in power. SOPA and PIPA were started in 2011, one year after Viacom lost the YouTube in court for the first time. Did that directly cause SOPA and PIPA? I couldn't find enough evidence to say that and be sure. However, what's interesting is that one year later, when SOPA and PIPA were stopped, something very curious began to happen. Have a look at this. 
This is a public transparency report posted by Google. Any of you guys can go check this out as we speak. It details the copyright takedown notices that Google gets as a whole. And if you take a look at where the surge begins, it's around the same time that the whole Sopo and Pippa battle was ending. As if big money companies turn to exploit the DMCA to get their way. Now, this is only an observation, but hell, not even Google search results are safe. But then again, what are you doing looking up free Star Wars anyway? You should know by now that nothing with Star Wars on it will be free. Yeah, devious bastards, you. Wow, big money companies are evil, man. I hate that they stand in the way of creativity. How can we stop big money companies even more? Whoa, no, 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 hold on, hold on, wait, wait. Please don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that these companies are wrong for claiming content. If any creator's work is being infringed, by all means, I will support the right to claim content that they worked hard to produce. Let's stay on track here. The real issue with the DMCA is the unclear meaning of infringement and transformative. If there is a textbook definition of infringement and transformative, say for example, uses less than 10% of copyrighted work, it'd be an easy measurable right or wrong answer. Another thing very important to see is that the DMCA is a two-way street. It's to protect any creator from having someone else gain from their work without an agreement. And to go more in depth, allow me to bring Grade A Underrated's original videos into this mix. I myself had Tyrone Magnus react to a video of mine a few months ago. One problem is that he never asked for permission. And if he did, I wouldn't have given it to him because I do not agree with reaction channels. I've made my feelings about reaction channels very fucking clear. But whatever, he went and stole my video anyways. It's not like YouTube fucking cares, right? Now, I'm gonna take his argument and apply it to anyone who views YouTube that way. What's curious to me about this is that any YouTube channel that views YouTube like that sounds just like Viacom and Viacom vs YouTube in 2007. Users on your site are stealing my stuff, which makes you to blame. And with this point of view, not only does YouTube have Hollywood and other big money companies yelling at them about things that they're not in control of, YouTube now even has its own users yelling at them about copyright claims that they're not in control of as well. And the worst part is, if they help out either side, they'll either lose the creators that support them, or lose lawsuits for aiding infringement. YouTube is in a very stalemated position. That's why it's very important to understand the real source of the issues, because truthfully, Grade A and anyone who views it that way, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Sure, maybe YouTube doesn't care about your specific issue, and if they did, how would they show that? Delete or claim videos that belong to you? Well guys, that's the copyright claim system. And to your point about... So because of YouTube's fucking stupid system, I am burdened with having to always stay on the lookout for people stealing my videos. I, as a video maker, have to shift some of my attention and my focus away from video making so I can be on the fucking lookout for video thieves. People stealing my videos becomes my responsibility. YouTube does nothing about channels that routinely steal videos like this. YouTube doesn't give a fuck. Again, they do give a fuck. That's why they have the very controversial automated claim system to counter your and big money companies' points about them not caring. Lastly, let's follow the logic. If someone posts a video that doesn't have a copyright agreement, telling YouTube to delete and punish channels like Tyrone Magnus, but not channels like I Hate Everything, who both have evidently published content without copyright agreements, is pretty much telling YouTube to define transformative. And to Mr. Ryan's point, you know, they're not a, a political advocacy group, they're a business. They're a, they're a website that runs a business. And to ask for them to be the ones who stand up to the government and fight every case is ludicrous. That's not their job. That's not anything they've ever said they would do. I think they've actually gone out of their way to try to do things where they help a Jim Sterling or things like that. And maybe we'll get some good case law out of that. You don't know. But it's uh, it's not their duty to fix the world. Though you, I, John, and Chuck Mangione might agree that playing Professor Pizza's Wall training mixtape with my own added edits and voiceovers is transformative, what if Professor Pizza watches it and doesn't agree that it's transformative? Just as Grade A and others don't think that Tyrone is transformative, shouldn't Professor Pizza have the same say that Grade A does for his work? More importantly though, why should YouTube have to be in the middle of these legal fights? I'm sure that YouTube really just wants to be improving their video player and not playing this is and this isn't. It's not YouTube's duty to fix the world.
Okay, so big money, small money, old school, new school, the DMCA is for intellectual property, period. But obviously there are issues. How do we go about fixing the DMCA? My, oh my, just look at that runtime. Yeah, this episode is a little longer than I expected it to be. Um, we're probably about halfway done. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pause it here. Uh, let's rewind it a bit. Cool, and now let's break. Uh, I'll see you guys for part three next week. Um, part three is gonna be about the solutions. So I uh, hope you all tune in. All right, I'll see you then. Oh, and come join me on Twitter in the meantime. Okay, bye.